Our guest in this segment is Moore Capito, the House Judiciary Chairman and a candidate for governor in the state. Moore will be in uh, Martinsburg, uh, well, in the Eastern Panhandle, at least on uh, on Thursday of this week. Moore, good morning to you. Thank you for being with us. Good morning, Rob. Thanks for having me. Good to be on. Great to have you with us. Uh, before we uh, get started, Moore, any, any comments or thoughts on the Bob Huggins situation at WVU? Sure, yeah. I was listening to your segment before. I think it's it's sad. I mean, you know, Bob Huggins has done so much for his alma mater, WVU, uh, you know, playing there and giving back, uh, and not just limited to, to coaching, but community involvement. Uh, you know, what he's done with the fish fry and for cancer research. So he's he's had a, a very large impact on not only WVU, but the state of West Virginia. And obviously his contributions to college basketball. Uh, clearly, um, there are some things that uh, he feels and the university feels that he needs to uh, deal with. So I, I think all West Virginians wish him the best and thank him. Uh, and hope and pray that he gets uh, what he needs to to uh, to move forward in his life the way that he wants to. You'll be in our area this week, Moore. What are you up to? Yeah, thanks for asking. So we have uh, begun a series of roundtables uh, across the state of West Virginia discussing public safety, uh, broadly speaking. And we started last week in Clarksburg, uh, had a very good discussion with community leaders about how we can improve uh, outcomes in our communities from the folks on the ground. And this week, uh, we're really looking forward to being in Martinsburg to uh, discuss those very same issues with the with the local leaders that are there from law enforcement to uh, council folks. Uh, also, we want to hear from teachers and resource officers uh, so we can begin to accumulate um, the information that we need uh, to make impactful legislation uh, next winter. More use the term "we" will be in town. Or is that part of your uh, your campaign for governor, or is it part of your role in the House, or what's the affiliation with the "we"? So that's a good question, Billy. Thank you. So the committee on the judiciary of the House side uh, is hosting these, uh, and as chair, I've been putting out the uh, the notice. So this is. This is house business that we're doing uh, in Martinsburg. Very good. So, and, now, and what have you heard so far, Moore? So really, it's interesting. I tell you, we have such a short period of time that we spend uh, in Charleston. And I, I've already just through one of these discovered, uh, you know, information and feedback that it would be tough to even distill in that short period of time. And one of the biggest, well, the two biggest themes that I think we've pulled from the first uh, visit that we had in Clarksburg was uh, number one was communication and number two was education. And of course, those are pretty broad buckets. But when we talk about communication, uh, it is how are the local police departments and the sheriff's departments and the educational system and the healthcare system communicating with each other? to uh, work in a collaborative way to improve uh, outcomes as it relates to public safety. Of course, Martinsburg has set a wonderful example with the Martinsburg Initiative, which has really proven uh, very successful so far in getting collaboration with the stakeholders. So it's, uh, and also obviously it includes your judges and your prosecutors, which we had there last week in Clarksburg. Um, so, so really getting communication from all of those groups together so that they're sharing information uh, so that we can discover the best ways to solve for the issues is number one. So that's local communication. And then communication, broadly speaking, across the state of West Virginia. So how are law enforcement uh, agencies in, let's say, uh, North Central uh, communicating with law enforcement agencies in Southern West Virginia or in the Eastern Panhandle or in the Northern Panhandle so that we're able to really share best practices because we know that in certain parts of the state, law enforcement has seen success with uh, certain tools that they're implementing and deploying uh, in their area. And we just wanna make sure that other parts of West Virginia are getting that as well. So that goes back to the communication piece. The other piece is the education piece, quite frankly. Um, you know, I think when the legislature comes into Charleston, we pass laws uh, that we believe, based on feedback we've received from folks in West Virginia, that's going to really move the needle. 
Um, but that is really a, again, a, a short, short window. Um, and being able to, once those laws are passed, disseminate that information quickly to the folks that are implementing that policy on the ground. And that's always local folks. Uh, so really discovering ways, and this isn't something you really pass in legislation. This is more just communicating with uh, local entities to ensure that they know that what the local and new updates are to the law so that we can enforce them. And then educationally, um, truly educational. You know, when I was growing up in school, uh, we had the D.A.R.E. program. Uh, every kid in school uh, knew the phrase, uh, just say no. So, um, you know, I, I don't think it's uh, it, it, it's a waste of our time to think of how do we begin to put more drug education into the classroom? And that was a big theme that we saw last week as well. The House Committee on the Judiciary will conduct a series of public safety roundtable sessions over the coming months. And their next one is this Thursday at 9 a.m. at the Robert C. Byrd Building Health Science Center East Dean's Office second floor do you need a reservation to attend more or can anybody attend no absolutely we invite anybody to attend and uh as i've often said <laughs> you hear a lot of folks in public service talk uh but as i've mentioned to you before i'm a listener and so i think the best way to learn and to find solutions uh, is to listen and i've also considered myself a doer so once we get the uh, solutions will get it done. But this this uh, exercise is all about listening. I, I think that we spent about maybe four, three or four minutes uh, with the backdrop of a structure of the meeting and then just had people come forward and share their experiences, share their frustration, provide their suggestions and sort of solicit their feedback, the true boots on the ground feedback of what's going on in the state of West Virginia. And I'm really, I was really encouraged last week. I'm really excited to be back in the panhandle. I was there last week uh, up in uh, Jefferson County talking about a new uh, groundbreaking up there. So excited to continue it this week in the Eastern panhandle. More, I'm, I'd like to come back in a couple of minutes for the purpose, uh, but a, a couple of questions before that. You've mentioned you're going to have you talk to the uh, prosecutors and the judges. Will other elected officials, such as the county commissioners and the board of education, also be active participants? We've invited all of those uh, individuals to uh, to come. Our office has uh, coordinated with uh, the mayor's office and council and commission to to have representation. We certainly do not want to limit. Uh, who can present and talk to the committee, because I think the more voices and the more opinions that we can have, the better. I think that's always the case. You mentioned uh, uh, communication education are both uh, major th uh, themes as, that have emerged. Uh, that would be common throughout all sections of the state. Do you anticipate there'll be some unique differences between what you hear in the eastern panhandle and, say, the southern part of the state? Sure, I think there's going to be some some differences. Um, I, I think thematically, I can't really say yet because we've only had one. So I'll have to report back to you. I'd love to come back on and talk after uh, our meeting uh, later on this week. But you know, I think we will hear some of the same uh, themes as far as uh, you know. Are we just rearresting? What's the recidivism rate here? Are we re rearresting the same people that are getting in and coming out and getting in and coming out? And, and how are we failing to sort of catch that and get those people either keep them in, in, in jail if they're causing a problem or in prison or, uh, or get the tools and the, the, the sort of educational tools to get these people reacclimated uh, into the system. I think where we will see probably some differences throughout the state of West Virginia is probably in our retention. Uh, when you look at teachers and police officers and resource officers, uh, which counties are struggling more in that area. Of course, we know that there are some counties that have implemented uh, those tools in their systems, and some counties haven't been, whether it's because of a strain on resources or policy. Uh, so I think that there will be uh, some differences, but, but uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from everybody Thursday so we can really get a good grasp on that. And as we continue, we'll, we'll start to see the, the themes. 
Now, come, coming back to my question about the purpose, uh, are these meetings uh, throughout the state uh, designed to gather information for a proposed legislative action that you already have been thinking about, or is it just trying to get a general feel for what the issues are and then use that information to lead for some subsequent legislative action? Well, I think it's both. Uh, the, the latter that you mentioned, I think, is how we sort of start uh, to try to uh, gather feedback. I mean, that's how I believe the best pieces of legislation come to be, is we take the most time that we have available to bring together as many people as we can and uh, solicit as much feedback as we can from people across the state of West Virginia to ultimately be able to put forward pieces of legislation that will be impactful. You know, we had somebody that presented last week and it reminded me uh, sort of a, an ethos to, to, to live life by, but, you know, too often we are sort of reactionary. And my focus with this roundtable tour is to, to make it so we're being proactive. So we're proactively getting out there and getting ahead of uh, what we're facing in the state of West Virginia as it relates to public safety, whether it's crime or drugs or our schools or our more urban areas, being able to walk, uh, you know, from your office building to lunch without being harassed. All of those issues are on the table. And ultimately, Billy, to your question, uh, we want to come up with a solution uh, that can be put forward in some sort of policy framework that can be impactful and help us be proactive in, in combating uh, public safety issues here in West Virginia. Yeah, uh, more. We've all we've often heard the statement: "You don't ask a question unless you know the answer." And I found in times past the same thing applies for roundtable discussions. Uh, but frequently, the most meaningful part of these discussions are surprises, something you had not anticipated. In the couple of meetings that you've had, has there been a surprise? I think one of the things – that's a great question, um, but, but I will go back to uh, structure here. In, in these meetings, I, I, I leave it open-ended when we start. I invite people to come up. We don't ask questions. We say, tell us what's on your mind and what's going on in the community as it relates to public service, and then we let uh, you know, a presenter go. Uh, so I don't want to lead anybody. I don't want um, them you – know, I want people to feel free to, to share their true opinion, uh, but – one of the things that stood out was, you know, we're having uh, delays in our labs. You know, we were talking to some of our law enforcement officers and our, our prosecutors uh, and, you know, just simply being able to get our lab results turned in time. And this is nobody, this is just, these are things that I don't think we really knew about uh, from the ground, but uh, are there ways that we can expedite the process so that we don't have people, um, you know, sitting in our jails for uh, an extended period of time awaiting uh, something that we could probably otherwise expedite. So, um, you know, that was one. And then, uh, you know, I don't think that this is completely surprising to everybody. But as we know right now, this drug epidemic is a moving target. You know, when I came in in 2017, we were mostly looking at uh, fighting back against methamphetamine and, um, and heroin. Uh, heroin doesn't even really exist anymore. So now we're really fighting, fighting a fentanyl battle. Uh, in the state of West Virginia, and we see based on the trends um, uh, on some of these sort of choke point maps that we get from that are actually posted online uh, that we're getting new drugs, these trank drugs. It's called uh, xylazine. There was a lot of talk about that. Uh, and so how are we going to formulate solutions uh, that get ahead of, uh, you know, drugs that are un uh, that, that, that aren't that cannot be foreseen, I suppose, More or unforeseeable. More Capito is our guest here on the program on Thursday of this week. He'll be hosting a meeting at the Robert C. Byrd Building uh, Health Science Center East, Dean's Office, second floor. That'll be at 9 a.m. at 2500 Foundation Way in Martinsburg. More the I'm going to circle back to uh, our philosophies and theories of imprisoning people. Here in Berkeley County, our day report center has done a tremendous job of uh, freeing up uh, our prisons from those who much, are in much more need of recovery services than they are of uh, punitive um, uh, um, sentences. And that's also helped taxpayers 
by reducing the jail bill uh, by over a million dollars annually, as we understand it, too. Is the state's philosophy for imprisonment one of rehabilitation or strictly focusing on that of uh, punitive uh, method of punishing for crimes committed? Well, I think for a long time it was probably the latter. It was probably punitive. But what we've learned is, uh, and the reality, quite frankly, is that many of these individuals that are being incarcerated for drug crimes, uh, especially low-level drug crimes, you know, possession, uh, low, uh, you know, low levels of possession, repeat offenders, we know that those folks are going to revisit the system time and time again if we don't get rehabilitative services in there. And that just really pulls on our jail bill, but it also pulls on all of our other resources because we have folks that are intertwined with the system that are never going to get out of the system and back on their feet. So as you mentioned, you know, you all have uh, an outstanding day report system that's providing relief on the entire, um, you know, judicial sort of flow of, of uh, folks that are coming in, in and out of the process. The drug courts that are operating in the state of West Virginia are really successful. The issue that we're having there, of course, is, is that, um, you know, not, not every area has, you know, equal access to these drug courts. And I applaud the judges that have stepped up uh, into those positions. And that's a lot of work uh, that they're putting in uh, to those drug courts. So really finding solutions like, like that, I, I think, are areas where we can impact and have greater outcomes for the people of West Virginia because it helps rehabilitate and it helps people get back on their feet and become productive uh, citizens. The One more bill, if you can uh, hold off just a second there. Matt Harvey is a frequent co-host on this program. Uh, we've talked on the air about a negligent homicide bill, and I know that didn't make it out of your committee last year due to time constraints. Can you see that being revisited in the next legislative session? Or Absolutely. That was one that we looked at, and I've, I've talked to Matt as well. Um, we will absolutely look back into that one as we approach. And, in fact, um, I'm uh, looking forward to connect on that soon. Uh, yeah, more mechanical problem uh, question, rather. Uh, of your committee, how many are participating in these uh, statewide tours? So this is a uh, – we've asked that any member of the committee, and also, frankly, we've, we've invited all of the local uh, area representation to uh, attend as well. Last meeting, I think we had five members of uh, our committee there. We had a senator there as well. Uh, so, we've, you know, we've had a handful at each of these meetings. You know, our, our members of our committee are spread all over the state, of course, and, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're here in the summer, so I know that schedules are, uh, are tough to sort of get everybody on board. But I've been very pleased at the feedback that we've had so far, and, um, and including the one coming up on Thursday, it sounds like we'll have good representation as well. Are most of the meetings during the day, or do you try to schedule some for the evening as well? So far, our, our first one was at uh, 2 p.m. This one will be at 9 a.m. Uh, we've tried to make them during the during the weekday, uh, but certainly are not opposed to if we get feedback moving them into the evening as well. And where the one for Thursday, where will it be? Uh, Rob, as Rob had announced, it's going to be at the Health Science Center uh, on Thursday at um, 9 a.m. And what is your next one after that, Moore? Is it scheduled yet? We have one tentatively scheduled to be in Boone County, yes, in, uh, sometime in mid-July. I think we're looking at July 17th. So we will do uh, – we'll be in southern West Virginia. We'll be in the northern Panhandle and probably the mid-Ohio Valley. Uh, in, in fact, I'll tell you, Rob, we just did one of these uh, last week in Clarksburg, and I've had requests from other areas of the state to see if we might be able to visit there uh, and have, have a roundtable. So – let me just tell you this. This is just kind of who I am. Um, I will push to have as many of these as we possibly can uh, with people's schedules because I don't think you can ever hear enough, um, you know, from our communities because, again, these are the people on the ground. These are the boots on the ground. And I think this is how we become proactive in, in, in putting forward good policy. The uh, uh, During the roundtables, are the comments – 
recorded and are they subsequently distributed? If someone has an interest in a particular subject, will they be able to recover what was said during the roundtable? We haven't really recorded them. I mean, we we, uh, we we make them obviously open to the public. You know, we invite anybody that wants to come uh, to come. The, the sort of the, I suppose, the setup of these roundtables has just been uh, very informal. Uh, we don't want to make it formal because anytime you sort of insert too much formality, you get, you know, you don't really get a, a true feedback uh, from individuals. So we've tried to make them informal and just had uh, folks come in and present and then just had a discussion, just a back and forth sort of kitchen table discussion. More your counterpart on the Senate side, Senator Charles Trump, the Judiciary Chair in the Senate, has made the announcement he will be running for state Supreme Court. How much work did you do with Charlie Trump as you were both judiciary chair and each is uh, a house or a wing, so to speak? And uh, what do you think of Charlie's chances? I, I can't think of a finer individual uh, in the legislature uh, or an individual that's more suited to put on a black robe than Charlie Trump. Um, I tell you, I've probably between he and John Schott, I've probably learned more uh, in you know, three or four years in the legislature than I have my entire legal career. Uh, he is a, an incredible mind uh, and has an incredible ability to take a piece of legislation and scroll through it and redline it with an old school red pen uh, better than I've ever seen anybody do it before. So I'm really excited for uh, for Charlie and his next step. Obviously, I'm supportive of him. He's a good friend. He's been a great mentor. And uh, I can't thank him enough for everything that he's taught me along the way. More obviously, you're running for, for governor. Uh, will you be able to run for governor and run for re-election in the House at the same time, or will you have to give up your House seat? I, I'm not seeking re-election to the House of Delegates. Uh, I think legally uh, I, w I wasn't planning to because I think I want to uh, – the people of West Virginia deserve uh, my full attention to this race, uh, which I intend to give it. So I will not seek re-election to the House of Delegates. Uh, all of our efforts will be focused uh, to being the state's next governor in 2024. It's very early in the process, but are you uh, satisfied or comfortable with the progress you've made in getting your name out and getting your platform out to the uh, folks in West Virginia? Great question. The answer is absolutely yes. You know, I think we've probably done about t between twelve and 15,000 miles since the new year uh, on West Virginia roads alone, which I think, as we know, there's a lot of roads in West Virginia, but they're not all direct. And uh, we've had the opportunity to spend a great amount of time uh, in the eastern panhandle getting to know uh, folks that have not um, that I have not met personally yet. Uh, folks in southern West Virginia and, and, and the northern panel, and that, that's the best part. Uh, there is uh, a huge uh, sort of life uh, that you can feel among West Virginians ready for a new generation of leadership. Uh, it's invigorating to me every single time that I get out there. I'm looking forward to being, of course, in the Panhandle Thursday on official business. Uh, but, you know, as, as a part of that, we'll get to see and talk to and meet new people and that's the best part of this. So I'm excited about it. Uh, the people of West Virginia are excited about it. And I couldn't be more optimistic about where we are right now today. As a build on to that, uh, you you have the name recognition. So you, you have the advantage of, of uh, superb name recognition. However, uh, you're in several of your uh, competitors for the governor also have good name recognition. Uh, how will you play? How will you get some leverage uh, uh, with your a very strong field of, of of competitors for the race. He'll start rumors about the other candidates, Bill. That's what I think I'd do. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and not good rumors not either. Not good ones either. Yeah. Okay. No, I appreciate the question. I mean, I think I'm, I'm a conservative that's always gotten it done. And, you know, there's going to be other good people in this race, but I'm confident that uh, what we have gotten done uh, in, in the state house and where the state of West Virginia is right now is something – that I think will resonate with the people of West Virginia. You know, when I came in uh, to the legislature, uh, I spent my first couple of years listening, uh, but it wasn't long before we needed to build the team 
to really create a conservative West Virginia, and I was proud to lead that team in building the first supermajority in the history of the state of West Virginia, and everything starts with a good team. And when we needed to build that team, I got it done. And when we needed to uh, ensure that we had uh, an environment where our kids uh, and our parents could choose, you know, greater choice in schooling, we got that done. And when uh, we wanted to lower the taxes in the state of West Virginia, we got it done. So time after time, when you look, whether it's sort of value-based policy or it's economic-based policy, conservative policy, time and again, I've gotten done in, in the West Virginia legislature. And I think people will see that, especially where we've gone in the past seven years and the leadership role that I've played uh, over that time. And, and having the ability to take all of that and really move West Virginia to the next level, I think folks will realize that I'll also get that done, and I plan to. More thanks so much for being on the program this morning. I'm sure you'll have a great turnout on Thursday morning, sir. I hope to be back on with you all soon. Thanks for having me on. We thanks always enjoy more. the conversation. Absolutely. More Capito. Appreciate you.